Good morning, everybody. This morning, we're going to start talking about the decision process, where we actually um, talk about decision making and how we choose a response to what we're doing. So this is part of the information processing model, and once you perceive that an action or a stimulus has occurred, then in fact you are up to the decision process. I want you to notice that as we increase the number of choices or the number of stimuli that are presented to an individual, that that would actually increase the difficulty of the task or in essence increase the decision-making part of the information processing model. So you'll notice that in this slide we're looking at a very simplified model of information processing. Later on in this slide set I present to you a more complex information processing model that was presented at first by a man named Welford. And in this simplified model of information processing, you could see that the first part of information processing is the input. And that would be the stimulus coming into the system. Notice that I could have an internal stimulus or an external stimulus. An external stimulus would be a ball coming in my direction that says it's time for me to respond to the grounder or to the line drive or to the high pop to the outfield. Or I might have an alarm that sounds in the morning that tells me that it's time to get up. Or I may actually say to myself, you know what, I need to look in the mirror with a brush in my hand and I have to see the way my hair looks because I want my hair to look really good for the video and that would actually be an internal stimulus. I am providing the stimulus for something that I'm going to do and notice that this is a goal-directed movement. It's conscious movement. Once you have input, which would be your stimulus, after that, we go to what's called central processing. We've already talked about the first part of central processing, which would be perception. After perception, if the stimulus is strong enough to be perceived, if it is clear enough and intense enough, and it's important enough to us. In other words, it has pertinence or meaning in our lives. Therefore, it's going to attract our attention, our selective attention. And so at this point, once we have selectively attended to the information, we have to make a decision about what we're going to do with that information. So we are actually in the middle of this central processing unit. Um, in decision making and the last part of central processing will be something called effector. Probably next week or the week after we'll begin to discuss the effector process. So what is the decision process? The decision process is the place where performers actually develop a plan or a strategy for the movement. The decision process is where the performer takes the information from perception and actually chooses a response. This doesn't mean that we are executing the response yet, but rather this is the input side of the model or the middle part of the model where we've gone from the input and the perception of that input to actually making a decision about the response that we're going to make. We call this decision the motor plan. I want you to remember that we've already talked about the motor pattern. The motor pattern would be described as the output. Remember the biomechanist is interested in analyzing the motor pattern, but in fact in motor learning we use the motor pattern a lot to describe learning. And in fact, um, motor learners use a lot of biomechanical tools now in order to be able to describe more about learning. 
Also, we've talked about the motor program very tangentially. Uh, next week, when I start the effector process, I will talk about the motor program and the structure of the motor program. But today, what I want you to focus in on is the motor plan. The motor plan is the decision about what you plan to do with your next part of the movement. So here is a very nice model. Notice that we're talking about reaction time here. Reaction time is the measure of the time that a stimulus occurs all the way through central processing and to the exact moment that movement begins. So if we look a little bit more deeply at the reaction time measure, you'll see that reaction time measures the afferent flow of information. In other words, from the uh, stimulus location, could be my fingertip, could be from my eyes, could be a stimulus to the bottom of my foot. There is an afferent flow of information from the place of the input to the brain. Then there is the processing by the brain, which we're calling central processing. It includes perception, decision, and effector. And finally, once I send out the motor program from the brain to the musculature to be able to move my hand or to be able to move my mouth, we would say that there is in efferent flow of information. So I want you to notice here in this model you have a variable and homeostasis. In other words, not a lot is happening there. But once a stimulus produces a change in the variable, notice the imbalance in the system. And these imbalances are then detected by a receptor or sensor, and then it goes from the through the afferent pathways to the control center. This is what we're calling central processing. Also, part of central processing would be the effect of process. That's different from the efferent flow through the effectors from the brain to the musculature. I want you to remember that the effect of process is the process that comes after um, the decision process and central processing, and that's where you create the motor program. The motor program is then used to govern the output. Once there's output, you might once again be a system in homeostasis, or there may be an additional stimulus to uh, start the response. I want you to notice that in this model, you have something called a closed loop. In other words, uh, notice how the model presents to you a closed loop. There's no opening there. And a closed loop model in motor learning is one where feedback is included in the model. So that provides us a mechanism by which we can actually determine whether we moved as planned and whether our movement was effective or not. I'll come back to an open loop model a little bit later. I also want you to note that this entire process, reaction time, takes time. And it's different for auditory signals versus visual signals. An auditory reaction time is approximately, the fastest would be approximately 160 milliseconds, whereas a fast visual reaction time is about 190 milliseconds. Here I'm talking about a simple reaction time. We've discussed this in lab and lecture. A simple reaction time means that there is a single stimulus and a single response to that stimulus. Why do you think that visual processing takes longer than auditory processing? Think about that for a moment. Auditory reaction time will be faster than visual reaction time because auditory reaction time is not subjected to the rods and cones and the turning over of the image as in visual reaction time. 
Also, I want to let you know that the distance of the input mechanism uh, will also determine the distance from the brain to the input mechanism will also determine the length of the reaction time because what it will do is increase the length of time of the afferent flow of information. So, in other words, if I give you a stimulus to the bottom of your foot, I would expect the reaction time to that stimulus to be longer than if I gave you a stimulus to the eyes or a stimulus that's an auditory stimulus of audition. I'd like for you to study these next several slides, actually uh, two of them, and be familiar with these definitions of fractionated reaction time and looking at premotor, motor, and total reaction time. We're also going to go over this in the lab this week. As well, I'd like for you to be sure that you could define these different types of reaction time. And finally, I want you to please go out to the sports science video and observe this really incredible video on batting and reaction time. I'll see you in lab this week. I hope you have a good one, and I look forward to seeing you in lecture on Thursday.